We're coming in. One second. Okay. So Jordan, are we good? We are good. Just okay. Starting up. Right. All righty, well, let's uh, get started. Uh, welcome to the New Mexico Genealogical Society's quarterly uh, speaker series. My name is Henrietta Christmas. I'm one of the board members. And today we will be uh, featuring uh, Rabbi Jordi Gendra Dash Molina. <laughs> to give him a hard time about that. Um, Jordi is from Barcelona, Spain. He lives here in Albuquerque. He has uh, qualifications, PhDs in linguistics, Jewish history, Hebrew. Um, he has pr previously worked for the Jewish Federation of New Mexico, and currently he's self-employed. And he's our go-to person for a lot of questions when it comes to not only Portuguese citizenship, but the Spanish uh, citizenship and research. And so, Jordi, you want to get your PowerPoint going, and we'll just kind of turn it over to him. If you have questions, please put them in the chat room, and I will uh, mitigate them as they come up, and we'll go back and do questions at the end. And with that, I'm going to turn my video off, Jordi, and you are good to go. Welcome. Thank you very much, Henrietta, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us. And thank you, the New Mexico Genealogical Society, for inviting me to do this presentation. I feel very honored. Uh, probably some of you know me by voice. I never put the face with the voice. So here I am. And welcome to my little office. So that's my little office. Just a word of warning, I have two cats and one dog. So it's going to be a cat and um, Fun in doggy show, so it's got it's going to be a cat and doggy show sometime. Um, I also uh, have two computers. I'm going to have this one. So if you see me turning, it's because I'm moving between one computer where I have the Zoom and the other computer where I have the presentation. So uh, Shabbat Shalom to everybody and welcome to this presentation about the Portugal research, thinking about Portuguese citizenship the specific case of Bartolomé Romero and his family. Also, as Henrietta said, we're going to be talking about citizenship. So a friend of mine, uh, Ms. Teresa Santos, who is in the public, uh, I'm going to ask her to make herself known to Jordan Jones. Um, she is a Portuguese, she works with a Portuguese uh, law firm and she is here to answer any questions regarding that you have about the specifics for uh, the legal stuff. Remember, I'm not a lawyer and I'm gonna keep this presentation pretty much very simple regarding this. So we're gonna go through this now. First step is gonna be, come on, here, overview. So disclaimers, Portugal, but I have a case with Spain. Well, I'm gonna ask you that please understand that I'm not any longer employed by Jewish Federation of New Mexico. If you did your process through the Jewish Federation of New Mexico, please refer to them. I can help you regarding history or data, but the specifics you need to deal with the Jewish Federation of New Mexico. So 
that's a basic disclaimer. So I apologize if you felt like that that was an expectation that you had there. I'm, I'm very sorry, but please understand the, the circumstances. Also, what are we gonna be watching today is the process. Who, where, what, how, how long, how much. That's why I engage uh, Teresa uh, Santos' uh, help because she will be able to tackle the particulars of your case if you have one. What I will be tackling is step three, historical data, Bartolomé Romero and the whole family. This is gonna be important because the application requires to have a fully documented genealogy and also proof of the Jewish ancestry. In other words, that the Bartolome Romero have or are related to uh, uh, somehow to Judaism. And then it's going to be a step, uh, point number four, it's going to be some things to keep in mind that sometimes our perspective um, as Americans on how the administrative process works in Europe can, can be difficult, can be a, it can be a mismatch there. So I will go through some practical things there, okay? So first thing, the requirements for, citizen, for, for Portuguese citizenship. If you're planning to apply for Portuguese citizenship, you have to be at least 18 years old. What happens if you have children, if you're married and you have children? That's why I want to engage Teresa Santos. That's a case for her to answer. If my kid is 16, I'm not applying, but my, again, this is a question for uh, uh, an adult in the room. In this case, it's gonna be Teresa Santos. To be able to trace the origins of your family to a Sephardic Jew, that's, that's why the importance of this lecture, because this is what we're trying to establish. Who is excluded? Anybody who has a conviction of a crime punishable by three years or more in prison according to the Portuguese criminal code. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I just took this information from the Portuguese website. I don't know what's the punishment for possession, DUIs or anything like this. That's why you need to talk to a Portuguese lawyer. In this case, again, I repeat, Teresa Santos. And being involved in terrorism is another reason why you should not apply, you couldn't apply to Portuguese citizenship. For the rest, if you have a clean record um, and you are 18 and older and you, can, you have a genealogical work fully documented that brings you back to a Sephardic Jew, then you can apply for Portuguese citizenship. So how do we do this? So the first step, that you have again this is taken from the portuguese government website the documents that you need to submit to the portuguese for government for the uh, for the application of the citizenship is the certificate that's produced only by cil or cip this document does not need any apostille because it's already in portuguese and it's issued by a portuguese entity and there is no certified translation. The other document that you need is the birth certificate. All the, uh, the birth certificate needs to be apostilled and needs to be translated. To my knowledge, the, admi administrative port the Portuguese administrative law allows you to submit documents that are in Spanish, French, or, or English as long as the civil servant understands that. However, I would highly recommend always to have a certified translation. And I will touch base on certified translation. Background check, you need to have a background check in the places where you have been living since you were 16 plus. It has to be apostilled by the state or by the government. Um, if you are having, for instance, a federal uh, background check and uh, Texas to say something. Background check, the federal background check has to be apostilled by a federal agency, while the Texas 
has to be postilled by the Texas uh, Secretary of State. The documents are going to be issued in English, so you have to have a certified translation. Then you have to have the application form, which is already in Portuguese. That's what the lawyers are here for, and the lawyers uh, do this paperwork. Tips. If your passport expires in the next six months, I highly encourage you to renew it as soon as possible. You know you have read on the news that it's taking a long time to renew passports. So please, if you have your passport expiring soon, please renew the passport. Also, birth certificates cannot be normally, I mean, that's the rule of thumb, a year older. When I have learned all this, I have learned all this when I applied for my American citizenship. So it's this is tips that I have learned from different application from from my own application process, and so that's also the background checks cannot be more than six months old. You have to submit a background check that it's recent. Uh, probably the pro you will see that the process will take long, and probably you will be asked to keep resubmitting a new uh, updated background check because let's say the process can take three years so it cannot be that you committed a crime in the middle and then it will not pop up in the original background check so that's why on a regular basis you will have to you will have to uh, keep submitting the background check but again that's based on my own experience i would highly recommend as i said before that you check all this with a portuguese lawyer now the certificate of Sephardic heritage, only two entities can have the, can issue the Sephardic certificate is CIL, the Comunidade Israelita de Lisboa and Comunidade Israelita do Porto, uh, CIP. So in English, I'm gonna call them CIL or CIP. One of the questions that I'm expecting is when to apply to CIL, when to apply to CIP. The process is different. The process, uh, it's a different cost. It's a different document. We will touch base this in a second. The certification, or you can also apply with a certification proving affiliation to a Jewish community of Portuguese origin. Let's say I'm Jewish and I, I'm a Jew and I'm a member, an active member of the Portuguese Jewish community of New York. Um, then a document from there should be should be enough so those are the those are the two ways of obtaining the sephardic heritage certificate how do you apply normally in our cases it's going to be through a formal application through genealogy so the application is based on an application form that you can download from the website or you can introduce directly in the website and then you have to submit a genealogy. The genealogy has to be a direct lineage and it has to be fully, fully documented. So you have to include copies of the original documents indicating the source, indicating also um, if, found, if, if you found the, um, the document on family search or ancestry, then you have to indicate the website and when you access the website. And also it's highly, it's highly recommended that for manuscript documents, meaning documents that are handwritten, you have to bring a transcript. Sometimes the documents, the copies of the documents are not good. So it's very helpful to do a transcript of the document and to make sure that you're reading the document properly doing the transcript of the document also helps you to double check all the assumptions that you have on that document. I have been in the case that I, I remember one case that I saw in the printed genealogy. Okay, there is, there is a baptismal record for such and such guy. But when I went to final search and I downloaded the document and I begin to, to read the document, then I realized that the document it says that yes there was i baptized such and such kid the son of such lady widow of 
as soon as I read that, then that forced me to rethink what I was thinking, what my assumptions about the document. In other words, then I had to double check the life of the father because the genealogy was based on the paternal side. So then I, I went immediately to double check the life of this individual if, if he uh, was alive at the moment of conception or if he passed away before the moment of conception, because then it would be two different things. This is how uh, carefully they read these type of documents. So it's always good to do the transcript because then you're forcing yourself to review the document and to challenge your own assumptions about the document. The second element that you have to have or the second part that that genealogy has to have is the proof of Judaism. How do I prove that my ancestor was Jewish? You're going to have, I divided this into different cases, recent cases, which would be 18th century to 20th century. Normally, you can still have synagogue affiliations, grave markers, passengers, manifest, etc. Normally, if you have, if my grandparents came from, I'm going to, I'm going to go wild. They came from Russia in the 1800s, or they came from Germany in mid 1850s, which was the first Jewish uh, wave of immigration into the United States. The immigration records will keep track of who is Jewish, who is Catholic, who is Protestant. So that's one way of proving that. For historical cases or early cases like 16th to 18th century, like it's our case, normally you don't have synagogue affiliations, grave markers, or anything like this. So it's going to be it's going to be based pretty much on archival records, such as Inquisition cases. Uh, also, it's good to accompany those with doctoral dissertations, peer-reviewed academic publications, all these kind of things. They they bring more substance. Do you claim that that person had uh, a Jewish heritage? So genealogical considerations. I know that, um, how can I say that? That we all have a mother and a father, but being a genealogist is more just of being aware that we come from, a mom, from mom and dad. So that's why I put this here because I think it's very important for anybody who is considering to apply for Portuguese citizenship and given the context in which we're finding ourselves today and probably this is going to be uh, part of the conversation at the end for the questions and answering. So I want you to have the following considerations regarding genealogy. Genealogy always assumes a present, a present existence of the past. It's what we call ontological reality. Genealogy is primarily a compilation of facts of vital data, migration, occupation, religion, etc. The past, however, cannot be just uh, isolated from the interpretation of the facts. History is a combination of facts and interpretation, which leads us to what I call the narrative. In other words, yes, I can go to family search and I can copy and paste 15 documents. As a, someone who was analyzing documents in the past, it's like, okay, you're giving me 15 photocopies of what exactly and how this is connected, how photocopy one connects to photocopy two, how photocopy two, two connects to photocopy three, and so on, because it's going to be about 14, 15, 16 photocopies. So you have to, you have to give me some interpretation. Who are those guys? Why do I see here a name that now changes? I see Jose here and I see, oh, well, that happens. Welcome to New Mexico. Uh, we have these crazy things that people change names here and there. And I'm talking about recent times. Uh, I have a friend who told me just this is an, a, an ad, but it's going to be a, an interesting case. He told me, he's a young guy. He told me, by the way, I just realized that my dad is not the family names they don't match. What do you mean? He was born, uh, the father was born out of wedlock. So they gave him the full family names of the mother. Later on, grandpa and grandma got married. And then they, they, he had, he has another set of documents with the 
family name from the father and the family name from the mother. So he has a passport and a driving license that do, not, that do not match, and he has a birth record that says something different. Um, yes, this is New Mexico, and this happens more frequently than what we think. So that's why having a genealogy that can help you to sort all these kind of things is very helpful. Genealogy also, um, that's a personal take. I know that many of you, they're thinking about passport, citizen, U, uh, UE citizenship. For me, genealogy is a little more. For me, genealogy is not just that goal. For me, genealogy is a way to understand the history of my own family. It helped me to understand uh, things that happened in my family. Um, so genealogy can help you to uh, that self-development, to happy to understand the world in which those people, our ancestors lived. One thing that will pop up constantly is in the early records, you see a 30 and a 40 year old man marrying a 12 year old girl. Clearly, this has to have consequences down the road. So this is the type of things that that's going to be like if if we judge though that document by our actual parameter, our present parameters, we would be scandalized. That was the norm back in the day. I have seen back in the early colony, I have seen girls of age eight and nine and ten getting married to grown up men. Um, especially with with indigenous people that's that's really very hard i mean there is a part of me that always wonder what, how they felt the family tree also i want you to, to remember this when you do your genealogy family tree is the product of choice and chance privilege and luck data but also affection how many times when I'm doing the genealogy for, for my client, I'm thinking, oh, wow, I would have, no, I would have loved to know this person. Or I'm wondering what, how they felt. Or I'm, I, I'm always left with this interest of knowing more about the family. That's why I enjoy uh, talking to families and knowing more about what they remember about grandpa or grandma, because it really, the data is like the bones. All this personal information is like the flesh, the veins, the blood that runs through you. And we are, this is how I look at myself. I am the, 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 the heir of all that history that come to me through my parents, the history of my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, the history of my great grandfather, uh, paternal great grandfather. So all these kind of things, I'm present. I know that I'm not just a collection of genes. I'm also a collection of experiences that they, that they have come passed down through generations. Why do you need to hire a professional? Look, contemporary genealogical work is issued as today we can see in nationhood, ethnicity, religious and, um, and cultural politics. So that can be crazy. For instance, I remember a guy who uh, <laughs> submitted uh, a genealogy or submitted the paperwork to Portugal. And he asked me why they're not going, why they're giving me an answer. I say, look, your documents are the documents that you submitted to the Spanish government. It cannot be that you can, that you're using the same documents without translation, without reworking. It's like looking for a job and sending the same application letter with the same resume without working that to meet the requirements of the, of the employer. So it's the same process. You cannot submit, you cannot just recycle one thing from Spain and submit it and recycle it for Portugal. You need to understand, you need to do your homework, what's required there. So it's good that you have done the, the process for Spain. You can build on that, but you have to understand that you need to reshape it in order to answer the needs of the request from the Portuguese government. A professional genealogist use records information as evidence to answer the question on uh, the research topic or our ancestors. 
that's crucial. Sometimes you may get a feedback from CAL or from CIP saying, oh, we want this or we want that. And you may not understand what they're asking for. We are confronted with those questions on a more regular basis. So that applies to any of the genealogies that, that I will mention at the end. The goal of genealogy is to uncover the truth and relationships of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. I had cases in which I can say, hey, someone jumped the fence here in 1700s. Um, that's, that's, another, that's an interesting question, especially when you do DNA. Mastering genealogical knowledge requires theoretical knowledge as well as extensive experience. And here I cannot say thank you enough to Henrietta because she has helped me so many times when I go into one of those places that they say, oh, I cannot find the documents. We help each other. In the same way that Henrietta asked me to do this presentation, um, I know that I can go to Henrietta and, and Henrietta will supply me with that will that I was not able to find. But because she knows that will by heart at this point, so she can she can provide me with a copy. Oh, 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 Esquivel, Mr. Esquivel. I mean, he has helped us so much on Facebook over the last year providing documents. Genealogies, we work in a close knit community, and and I'm not thankful enough. And again, I I, I cannot keep. I will emphasize this again and again and again. We work together. My success is your success, and your success is my success. So, so this is how I look into this. I look much more into collaboration, and I think that many of us will look into collaboration. Working towards an end, the genealogical research recreates a family's ancestry, ancestors, descendants, family structures, relationships, facts, and events. Believe me, it can be very complicated, especially as we will see today when we will talk about Bartolomé Romero's, uh, sorry, Francisco Gomez Robledo's case. So you will see how I'm going to walk you orally, but you will have a sense of how I'm doing it on writing. And finally, last but not least, uncovering what was concealed. We're talking about crypto Jews. We're concealing everything. So, you know, I mean, every family has a skeleton in the closet. So uncovering what was concealed, sometimes this is what requires a little effort. So we know what are the genealogical standards. So we, um, we have been working on this for so long that we know these, these kind of things. We know how to not to uncover. Uh, it's about how to raise the question in order to get the answer that you're looking for. So. Moving on. Now, let's go into the third part of this presentation, Bartolomé Romero's hometown. So when I confronted this question, I confronted the question in the following way. Is there a Jewish community before Bartolomé Romero in Corral de Almaguer? Here you have a wonderful picture of Corral de Almaguer, which is provided in the, in the tourist office of the little town. If you go to Wikipedia, it's today it's a 5,000 people inhabitant town, very small. Where is it located? It's located in the middle of Spain uh, near Toledo. So my first question was, hmm, do, is there a Jewish community there? Again, uh, as Stan Hort uh, quotes in his book, page 126, for, uh, foot 40, he quotes uh, Carta a las Justicias de Corral de Almaguer para que se obligue a los judíos a vivir en el recinto señalado. Meaning, in other words, in 1483, there is a letter that forces, there is a letter to the justices, meaning to the sheriff, uh, that forces all the Jews to live in a ghetto. What type of ghetto and what type of Jewish community we're talking about? At this point, I would think it's more about the a group of 15, 20 families. It's a very small Jewish community, probably one street. We see this pretty much all over Spain, except for the big Jewish centers like Barcelona, Girona, Saragossa, Toledo. 
you have other centers like Inca to say Mallorca. In Mallorca, you have 30 families living all in one long street. So at this point, I'm thinking that this is what we have there. We have about 15, 20 families living in one single street. It's a very small Jewish quarter. But the fact that there is a letter from the, from the government to the sheriff saying, hey, make sure that they live all of them, they live sequestered in the ghetto. That's important because it tells us that there is a Jewish presence. So if there is a Jewish presence, what happens later on? So going through, um, again, this is based on Stan Hortz. You will see that I will refer to Stanley. Stanley, if you're hearing me, hi. Um, that's uh, that's going to be the Bible in this case. Um, so Stanley in, the no in note 42, he quotes a series of Cristianos Nuevos. We need to go to the documents in order to make sure that we have those elements there. In this case, you look, and this is what Stanley did. He went through the baptismal records and he listed Cristianos Nuevos. Um, I was privy to see some of the documents that he shared with me. The list is much longer. The list is much longer. So here, what I what I chose is what he had made available in the book. Also, remember, when you publish a book, the publisher may you may go with a five hundred pages book, and you think, oh yeah, yay, the publisher will publish this, um, and the publisher will tell you, well, you know, I cannot publish a five hundred pages book. I can publish a three hundred pages book. And then you have to do, uh, you have to edit yourself. You have to decide what you're going to leave in and what you're going to take out from the book. So uh, Stan must probably left uh, out of the book a lot of information. So he had to do some editing process there. And it would be nice if one day um, uh, I'm going to encourage him to, to write something about what he left out, because that would be also important about what he had in mind and what came out published. So moving, uh, moving on, he gave us three cases, there are more, but I'm telling you there are more, um, in which you have Cristianos Nuevos, meaning this is indicative that that population that in 1483 was sequestered in one street, they converted, they did not leave, or some of them stay and by staying they had to convert so lucia hija de andres gonzález y maria fernandez cristianos nuevos compadres andres romero y mari romero hijos de sebastián romero so here you have the link between there is a family called gonzález y maria fernandez andres gonzález y maria fernandez and they are cristianos nuevos the case here is important because it shows you that the compadres, the godparents are Andres Romero and Mari Romero, which means that there is, it begins to have, it shows, the records begin to show some familiarity. Luis, hijo de Luisa, Cristiana Nueva, no tiene padre, compadres, Bernardino Díaz y su mujer, Polonia Romero. Again, we see the name Romero related to a Cristiano Nuevo, a new Christian. So again, it's another reinforcement that they, it seems to be some familiarity. So they're moving around. Now, what's more interesting is this case. Alonso, hijo de Alonso Romero y Ana Fernández, al margen, in the margin, Cristiano Nuevo, Marzo, 26 de marzo, 1581. What's important in this record is, A, remember Spanish, as many of you know, Spanish, it's a gender language. So in the case above, we know that we're talking about a female because it's Cristiana Nueva. In this case, we know that we're talking about Alonso Romero because it says Cristiano Nuevo, masculine singular. And Alonso Romero happens to be the masculine singular there. So here you have a clear connection between Romero in Corral de Almaguer in 1580, 
as Cristiano Nuevo. And that's going to be, for me, that's the key element there that I need. So that's key. Alonso Romero, Cristiano Nuevo. Now, let's go to the next one. And I'm trying to remember what's there. There is another case that predates that uh, the case against Diego Hernandez. This is from Stan's book, page 113. It's a trial against Diego Hernandez conducted in 1518. So it's very early in which he quotes the testimony of Juana Gomez, Esposa de Romero. And she is 50 years old and she is labeled as conversa. So as Stan, make, as Stan uh, process this, he says in his footnote, okay, if in 1580, she is 50 and she is convert and she's married to someone Romero, chances are that they got married before 1492 and that both of them were Jewish. So that would be another connection. This is much more like circumstantial connection uh, about Juana Gomez being Jewish and the husband Romero being Jewish um, before the conversion in 1492. So that's something else to take into consideration. But again, that's not as main as Romero Converso Nuevo, this is much more a circumstantial proof. Let's review another circumstantial proof. Here in this case, um, other presence of the Jewish presence in the area. This is a map, Corral del Maguer, and I, uh, Google Maps, uh, as you can see, I put the little man to walk. So imagine that we're walking and on one corner on the, I'm dyslexic, so I need to see how this was. On the upper left corner, we have Corral del Maguer in the yellow square, okay? Then if you follow the blue line, the little man that says 16 hours, 30 minutes, you have Castillo de Garci Muñoz. Castillo de Garci Muñoz happens to be a well-known medieval settlement presence there. It's just, this is pretty strong city there. And you have um, Professor Petrel who published a very interesting article about conversos hidalgos in Castillo de Garci Muñoz. Meaning there is Jewish presence in Castillo de Garci Muñoz and they converted in 1492 the estate, they converted and you have Jewish presence, you have converso presence. Then if you look at the map, you will see that below, if you follow the road, uh, the, the yellow road, you will see that below Corral de Almaguer, you have Quintanar de la Orden. That's going to be important. And then keep in mind, at the bottom of the, of the map, you will see Argamasilla de Alba. That's also going to be very important. So you have there three, four cities, and they're all in the radium of 50 miles, 80 kilometers. So 16-hour walking, walking distance. Between Quintanar de la Orden and Corral de Almaguer, I'm going to say three, four hours, so a morning. So you can leave in the morning and you can arrive to, uh, to Corral de Almaguer in, for lunchtime. So that would, be, that would be the average. So although they are separated, I consider all these three locations very close in geography. 50 miles is something feasible for that period of time. So the next document that I'm going to show to you is the, is the Isabel Romero's case. Who is Isabel Romero? Isabel Romero was a woman living in Quintanar de la Orden. Remember the little town, which is like four hours walking distance down the road. And she said, oh, I'm a Cristiana vieja. I'm, a, I'm an old Christian. I have nothing of it until she was caught in an in inquisitorial process in 1591. Then the truth comes out. She is the daughter and the granddaughter of conversos. Therefore, she was converso. So according to the records that um, Rebach uh, compiled in his book, Antonio Enriquez Gomez on a Cliven uh, So what we have is Isabel Romero is the daughter of the merchant Pedro Romero y Maria de Cuenca who happens to be also the, the granddaughter of 
Diego de Cuenca y Ma, eh, Bárbara de Vera. So there you have again Pedro de Vera being a converso. This is another source different from Stan Hortz. So this is someone else who has looked at the documents and has reached the same conclusion that Romero appears also linked with conversions, in this case, in Quintanar de la Orden. And what's very interesting is that the whole family lived in Castillo de García Muñoz, which is that little town that, is, that it's about 16 hour walking distance. You remember the blue man that we saw in the previous, in the previous slide? So that's there. So here you begin to see how the Romeros are very much working around, around um, the Romeros appear very much linked, working around Jewish families, conversos. So the case dates in 1591. But that time, um, Bartolomé Romero is already, has already crossed over to the Americas. So he's going to be here. So just hold your breath for the continuation for that story. Continuing this. So what we have learned until now, we have a case dating back to 1518, the case of Juana Gomez, Mujer de Romero, which probably was a Jew and they were a Jewish marriage. They were a Jewish couple in 1488. We have the case of Alonso Romero, which is clearly labeled as Cristiano Nuevo in Corral de Almaguer in 1581, not that far away in terms of time and space from Bartolomé Romero. Pedro Romero. You will get there to, yes. Okay, sorry, I saw the puppet. Pedro Romero uh, is from Castillo de García Muñoz. It's the father of Isabel Romero. And Isabel Romero, there is an inquisitorial case against her. So now, this is a review of what we have learned until now. Let's continue. Now, let's take a look into, the, into Bartolomé Romero's baptismal record. If you do history, you need to learn paleography. When you do genealogy, you, learn, you need to learn paleography. And this is why. And this is what we do, transcripts. So this is a partial transcript of the document. So it says, seis días del ilegible de dicho mes de abril, baptizé, um, I don't know exactly what it means there, un hijo de Bartolomé Romero, mujer María de Adeva, llamóse, meaning he was called Bartolomé, padrinos de exorcismos, at this point the ex means, um, ex exorcismos, that's the, that's the ritual formula, Blas Ramírez and Juan Martínez del Campo. Madrinas, ilegible, mujer de eh, López Díaz, Anajea, mujer de Blas. I'm going to call your attention to a couple of things. Yes, the document does not link directly Bartolomé Romero saying Converso Nuevo, um, Cristiano Nuevo or Converso, or anything like this. The only link that we have between Romero and Converso comes from Alonso Romero. Okay. So in this case, we are in front of the baptismal record. What we can learn from the baptismal record is that the father is called Bartolomé Romero, the mother is Maria de Deva, and I want to call the attention to the other one that the padrino, the compadre, is Juan Martínez del Campo. And keep that thought for one second. Now, Maria de Adeva. Maria de Adeva, it's a problem there because the name, as you can see, I put it there, Maria de Adeva. So at this point in Spanish, we don't have, we have a grammar, but we don't have uh, orthography. Uh, we don't have, the right spelling is not yet codified. So the writings are gonna be, uh, they're gonna be graphic representations of what we pronounce. So if you say Maria de Adeva quickly, guess what it's on the ears of the of the person who is recording the the, the document what to put down whatever he hears so maria de adeva maria deva in the case of juan Mar, uh, juan um baptismal record this is the youngest brother what we have is maria de adeva okay and again What's very interesting and that caught my attention is Juan Martinez del Campo appears as padrino in both cases, in Bartolomé y Juan. 
Okay, so then is when I went to check who is Martinez del Campo. And Martinez del Campo happens to be someone who is born about 1540s and he went himself by his own admission, he went to the Inquisition in Toledo, in, sorry, Toledo, <laughs> to the Inquisition in Toledo to denounce himself as crypto Jew. And he was a neighbor in Argamasilla de Alba. You remember I mentioned Corral de Almaguer, Quintanar de la Orden, Argamasilla del Alba. So here you have the connection. And Juan del Campo is linked to a very important family, del Campo, which was persecuted. You remember Antonio Enriquez Gomez, that book uh, written by Reba? It's from page 100 to page, from 110 to page 116. It's the whole genealogy of the Campo family. And he gives you all the inquisitorial cases in which he's persecuted, the, the family is persecuted. So the fact that Isabel Romero marries into the Campo family, and the Campo family has a long history of persecution, of being persecuted as a script of Jews. And the fact that the guy, Mar Juan Martinez del Campo, appears twice in baptismal records for the Romero family. When we put all this together, it begins to smell like the, Rom the Bartolomero family is really connected to, um, is really connected to a conversion background. What's the next thing that we know about Bartolomé Romero? We know that Bartolomé Romero, at some point in 1885, he obtains the permit to move to the um, Western Hemisphere, to the Americas. Why he comes, I don't know. What I can tell, based on the Reva book, is the book that I mentioned before, is that about 1590s, things are getting very hot in that area. And the, and the Inquisition seems to be closing on that family. I want to mention that there is another a Romero that lives uh, a couple of years after to Peru. I don't know in full honesty, I don't know if, how they are related, but it's interesting that it's another Romero from uh, Corral de Almaguer now escaping to Peru. The reasons why people moved out of Spain can be very different. Spain at that point, despite all the money that they were getting from the Americas, Spain uh, went back during Philip II twice or three times, if I remember correctly. Also in 1555, with the Peace of the Habsburgs and the, uh, after the Peace of Westphalia, you have um, the end of a certain period of tolerance from 15 to 1550s. So makes sense that putting all these things together, and we will examine this when we talk about Robledo, that things are getting very complicated for that family, and he it's more convenient for him to move away. I don't know if they had family already here or not. That's another question. So what the transcript says is Bartolomé Romero, noticia para que dejen pasar a la Nueva España a Bartolomé Romero, vecino de Corral de Almaguer, dando información. So this is normally what you will see in um, una célula. So this is a, mani a manifest, so someone who is crossing. So we know when he left Spain and he came to New Spain. New Spain, meaning the vice royalty that covers from Guatemala up to New Mexico. Moving on. Now, this is much more interesting. Um, it's interesting not because <laughs> I will explain. This is the two travel permits, 1575, for the Robledo family. And I say it's interesting because it lists um, Alejo Robledo and Francisca Diaz as the parents of Pedro Robledo. And then you have Alejo, Francisco, Yana Robledo, and Pedro Robledo are the children. Pedro Robledo is married to Catalina Lopez, and they have Ana, Diego, Luis, and Lucia. So those names we know because they come here. So what's very interesting in the document, it's about 15 pages each. Reading through them, they have to do, they have to do um, reasons why they want to travel. They say, look, and it's very interesting that's in the, in the opening of this document, they say basically, look, 
We have nothing here to, we have nothing to do here. Life is very hard and we're dying of hunger. This is seven, 15, 1575. And we have those cousins living in, in Mexico City who are very rich and they, they have written us a letter saying, why you don't come? So we decided to go. Who are those two people? Miguel de Sandoval and Catalina Sanchez. Okay. As soon as I saw the name Miguel de Sandoval, I remembered the case, which is an inquisitorial case of Luis de Sandoval. I don't know who is the cousin, if the Sandoval, the Sanchez, um, what happened to them. That's much more interesting. That's, that's, that would be more research. I don't know exactly what happened to them or how they are connected with the Robledo family, but I'm just putting it there also to explain that yes, we have we have tracked the Robledo family back to the moment when they left Spain from Maqueda, from, from Spain, also from the province of Toledo. Next document. So we know Bartolome Romero, everybody knows this page. This is Romance, Descendants of Bartolome Romero. So we know Bartolome Romero marries Luisa Lopez Robledo and they have Pedro, Diego, Agustin, Matias, Bartolomé Romero, Ana Robledo Romero, and Maria Romero. I'm not going to explain all these documents. It would be too long to do the, the genealogical report here. I'm giving it for good. Then we go, Ana Romero marries Francisco Gomez. Here we have an interesting case. Francisco Gomez. One of the big questions is where has he been born? Some people have applied with Francisco Gomez as being born in Coimbra, Portugal. While the gen while Roman Esquivel hoards, and now me, I'm gonna prove to you that the guy was not born in Coimbra, was born in Coina, Portugal. Coina happens to be a neighborhood of Lisbon. So let's have let's see how we know that this happened. The first document I'm going to show to you is the manifest, the passenger manifest. So in the passenger manifest, you can read very clearly that it says Francisco Gomez, hijo de Manuel, natural de Lisboa, sin barba, un lunar al lado izquierdo del cuello. Okay. So there in a little red line that I don't know if you can see that. It says N, it's the second line of the zoom in. It says N dot de Lisboa. So I underline this. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's what you have. Um, that's what you have there. And that's in the documents. Correct, Relación de Pasajeros Sevilla. 1604. So this is when he comes with Alonso Iñate. Now, another document. The other document is the transcript from, or well, it's the, the position for the inquisitorial record. Francisco Gomez Robledo, Andres Gomez Robledo, Juan Gomez Robledo, they are persecuted by the inquisition. When you're persecuted by the inquisition, you have to explain who are your relatives? So that's why the inquisitorial records are so important. They're gonna give you uh, back in genealogical background, also like uh, diligencias, diligencias matrimoniales. So when we look at the document, and that was uh, shared with me by another person. I don't know who is a genealogist who did that. If you recognize this work, please, I'm thanking you for doing this work. Um, that was shared with me recently. Um, so thank you. I, don't, I, I would attribute the work. The person who shared with me never told me who did that work. So what we have there in the little, in the little two boxes on the upper right, it says Francisco Gomez Natural de la Villa de Coina, Cinco Leguas de la Ciudad de Lisboa. So that's in the inquisitorial record. So this establishes you have two different documents that establish that Francisco Gomez is natural de, no vecino de, 
the Spanish language is very, or the administrative Spanish language is very particular about that. Natural means to be born or to be native from. Uh, vecino de means to live, to have, to have your house in that place. So in this case, that he was born in the area of Lisbon, not Coimbra, Portugal. Now, moving on, Francisco Gomez. Also, in, the, in another inquisitorial case that we will now untangle, it said, this is, the, this is what we have, a, this is reported by Stanley Hort. Hace unos 20 años, about 1634, llegó a este reino un soldado portugués, Manuel Gómez, que se quedó con Francisco Gómez, de nacionalidad portuguesa, residente en esta localidad, ya fallecido a partir de 1662. Era de conocimiento público que el citado Manuel Gómez le dijo a Francisco Gómez que era judío y lo había conocido como tal, que los dos nacieron en la misma calle de Lisboa. So here you have that, that uh, statement for me comes to comes to confirm a third source that confirms that Francisco Gomez is from Lisbon, not from Coimbra. And now we're going to begin to tackle the issue of was Francisco Gomez Jewish? So here you have the declaration, you have a statement by Manuel Gomez in 1632 about Francisco Gomez being born in Lisbon and being Jewish. This statement comes to reinforce, or this statement coincides with the place of origin. If it coincides with the place of origin, then I'm going to give it credit regarding the statement about being Jewish or not. However, this is a stretch. I understand this. But now the, probab the probability increases. So now let's continue this. So we have what we have learned about Francisco Gomez. He's from Coina, Lisbon, Portugal. Sources, the Relación de Pasajeros and the Inquisitorial case. He's the son of Manuel Gomez. Sources, Relación de Pasajeros and see the bibliography of by Hort and Esquivel. He arrived to Veracruz with Alonso Doñat in 1604. Relación de Pasajeros. He married Ana Romero, the daughter of Bartolomé Romero and Lucía uh, López Robledo, or Robledo López. So, how do we know? Sources, Inquisition, cases against Francisco Gómez and Andrés Gómez Robledo. And finally, in one inquisitorial case, he was identified as being Jewish in Lisbon by a childhood acquaintance. It's inquisitorial case against Teresa de Aguilera. It's important now when we will deal with the, with the inquisitorial cases to see the whole picture, not to read only one document. And again, that's where the historian or the, the, the historian kicks in. So let's start there. The inquisitorial cases. First, we need to contextualize. I know that our friends from Portugal are not knowledgeable about New Mexico history and they have no obligation to be knowledgeable about New Mexico history. So here, and I apologize because I'm realizing that this is an hour now. So first thing, until 1848, when this territory becomes part, official part of the United States of North America, this part that we call New Mexico belongs to the diocese of Durango, Mexico. No Durango, Colorado. Durango, Mexico. And here you have a map where you can see Santa Fe and then Durango, Mexico. The total amount of kilometers is 1,500 kilometers. So if you try to walk this, it's about three months. Walking distance. Um, remember that at that point, people travel in carromatos uh, with wages, with oxen. And this is going to take about 10, 15 miles a day. So do the math, how long it's going to take. If you go with one of those um, um, carriages, how long it can take for you. Better you're going to go walking. So, and so since 1598 until 1848, records, um, everything has to, everything comes from Durango, Mexico. 
This is important because then we have the Franciscan friar, Nicolás de Villar, who says, who has identified Jewish practices in several, in several inhabitants here in this place called New Mexico during the previous, during the, during the previous times, during the 16, mid 1600s. But the problem is that the next branch of the, of the Inquisition is in Durango, Mexico. It's far, far away. At this point, um, Albuquerque does not exist. Uh, El Paso was founded after the Pueblo Revolt. Uh, the next town, the closest town is El Parral, Chihuahua, which is in the south part of Chihuahua. We're talking about a couple of weeks walking through the desert. And here, what you have is you don't have inquisitorial presence in, the, in, in, this, in this area. So if we know about, now we're gonna be facetious, so please apologize, I apologize. But think about this, if you have to denounce an inquisitor, a, a case to the inquisition and you don't have any officer of the inquisition here, to whom are you gonna to talk, to the coyotes? That's a reality of the case. And that's why, that's why it's so important to contextualize this. As Stanley put, uh, New Mexico was literally the end of the earth. And as Ron Duncan Horton says, this is a golden cage. You cannot go back, you cannot go north, you cannot go east, you cannot go west. I mean, you are basically trapped here. What's also, what's also very interesting is this statement, you can, it can be found on the case against Bernardo Lopez de Mendizabal, who was the governor whose grandfather happens to be conversal also. So that's, that's, very, that's a very interesting case. So when we read the cases, and now we're gonna list them, we have to read those four cases together because they are linked. So the Inquisition cases begin in 1662 and 1663, and they will last a couple of years. Context, the Grand Conspiracion has already, is past and gone. 1650s. When that happened, Portugal gets independence, Portugal marries, with, there is a big connection between Portugal, the Braganzas, and the, and the Royal and the English. Uh, Portugal gives Tangier to England, giving control to the Gibraltar Strait to the English, and the Spanish are very upset. Then they begin to realize, oh my God, we have a bunch of Portuguese people in our colonies. Are they going to be the fifth column? That, prom that prompts then um, a research in by the Inquisition about who, who is about what, what we're here, Portuguese, etc. The Inquisition is the secret police. The Inquisition, it's not just a religious organization. The Inquisition is a political religious organization. And they have the task of finding out how deep the Portuguese connection is in the colonies, is in the Western Hemisphere, from Peru up to New Mexico. Uh, basically, the Inquisition, the Inquisition has the process for the, the Gran Conspiracion, the Great Conspiracy, that's why it's called Great Conspiracy, in 1650s. After that, the Inquisition loses interest in Judaizing cases. Uh, the main concern for the Inquisition in this area is going to be Brits, Dutch. They are in competition. Jamaica is falling. Uh, the Dutch are moving in. Uh, this is about commerce. This is about money. Follow the money. Follow the track of the money. Um, so the Inquisitor and New Mexico also we don't have silver, we don't have gold, we don't have anything that it's um, monetarily important or financially important. So this is a piece of land that has no geostrategical interest. The geostrategical interest from part of the crown has shifted towards the English and the Dutch. Basically, New Mexico in 1660s, it's a forgotten, a for, forgotten territory up there. The cases, the inquisitorial cases have to be read more, from my perspective, more in the internal conflict between the friars and the secular branch 
or the secular world. So what cases we have there? We have the famous case of Francisco Gomez Robledo for suspicious of the delitos del judaismo. So Francisco Gomez Robledo, he is accused of being a Judaizer. Diego Romero, the brother, the same thing. Juan and Andres at the bottom, same thing. And then in the middle, we have Bernardo Lopez de Mendizabal, who was the governor, and Teresa de Aguilera y Roche, who was the wife of the governor. So why those two four elements or those five people get together in this case? The Gomez Robledo, together with the Lopez de Mendizabal. The Lopez de Mendizabal was the secular power, okay? The Gomez Robledo, they were the, land, the great, the big land owners from Pecos to all the Santa Fe area, basically. Um, so they were very much in cahoots, so to speak, with the Lopez de Mendizabal and Teresa de Aguilera y Roche. So there is a strong connection. That puts, a, that puts the family at odds with the friars. And the friars have an axe to grind against the Gomez Robledo and against the Mendizabal. So that's why the cases are prompted at that point. And that's why the four cases have to be read together. So the statements that you have in one case applies to the other case, as we have seen uh, regarding Francisco Gomez. So now, going to specific proofs, this is the cover of the case for, against Francisco Gomez. As you can see, it states, I did not uh, uh, transcribe this, it clearly states, El Sargento Mayor, Proceso y Causa Criminal contra el Sargento Mayor Francisco Gómez Robledo por sospechoso de delitos de judaísmo y de haber dicho presuposiciones heréticas. So you can see that there is a blank there. So this is the famous uh, document, the number 268, and this is the seal, says Archivo General de la Nación, México. So it's available and it's available on family search. So then, uh, Francisco Gomez Robledo was detained and he had uh, two recognitions in two different occasions of his uh, genitalia because the accusation was that they practice circumcision. Remember, back in the 1600s, you don't have um, anesthetic. So practicing a circumcision is something hurtful. Um, in this case, in two occasions, and I forgot to put the dates, but in two occasions, they, the doctors checked the, the, doctor check the, um, the genitalia of Francisco Gomez Robledo. And in both, uh, in both occasions, they conclude that there was a cat made with a sharp instrument. So yes, he was circumcised. In another document, uh, the, the, there is another deposition by friends that they know we have known them since childhood. And we used to go to bathe in the river together, naked, of course. And we knew that they were circumcised. So that's clear, that's clear there. So then for Andres Gomez Robledo, there you have what, what, you have, what I just mentioned. The, in yellow, you have Andres Gomez Robledo, hijo de Francisco Gomez, uh, y de um, uh, Ana Romero, okay? And then you have the specific, um, then you have, now I'm gonna go to the transcript. Uh, difunto de Nación Portuguesa y de Doña Ana Romero sobre tener los usos dichos, señal de circuncisión o rotulación meaning someone went around their penis and circumcised them. This is what the rotulation means. There is no other way of understanding this. This is, I mean, it's very hard for me to understand that that would be by accident. Very hard for me. Uh, so, uh, and then it can, lo que manifiesta que son observantes del judaísmo y consiguientemente que por ello deben ser castigados severamente por ese santo oficio, typo, con las penas por derechos establecidas, por lo cual, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so now let's, because now I'm talking too long. We have the inquisit in the inquisitorial case against Juan y Andrés Gómez Robledo, hermanos de Francisco Gómez 
y, An y doña Ana Robledo, Romero le hace Robledo respecto a la citada señal de circuncisión o corte que demuestra que son observantes del judaísmo. This is what you have there. This is exactly from the inquisitorial case, uh, case 598, expedient number seven. Okay. So, some conclusions. The closest branch of the Inquisition is Durango, Mexico, long distance. Uh, Francisco Gomez is accused of being Jewish by different witnesses at the same time. I think that it's about 10 or 12 people. Cases against, you have inquisitorial cases that clearly the, the, the case is for being Jewish against Francisco Juan de Andres Gomez Robledo. Other people in the same time and space are accused of Jewish practices like Mendizabal y Aguilera. And then what are the Jewish practices? Circumcision and death rituals, which is very much, um, as a rabbi, I know that when, <laughs> when, you, when you do a mistake in a funeral ritual, people get a little worried uh, because they want to make sure that their soul is gonna go to heaven. So you want to have a good funeral, you know what I mean? So that's why circumcision, those um, passage events are so important for people because they, kind of a guarantee that you are in or you are out or you are to heaven. So, so that's important. So now moving on, overview of the whole presentation. We have documented, and this is important for me to say, it, it's based on documents that we have seen in the last hour that the Romero in the area of Corral del Maguer and Quintanar de la Orden, so that specific area in that specific time appears as conversos A, in the dismal records and be in inquisitorial cases. We have documents that have proof both things. Second conclusion, we have documented in front of you, you have seen this for the last hour, that you have the travel permits for Romero coming from Corral de Almaguer, the Robledos, the whole family coming from Maqueda and from Francisco Gomez coming from Lisbon. In this case, differently from other cases that we have in the same time and space in the Rio Grande Basin, we can, we can be proud that we can link them to specific times and to specific places where they came from. And three, we have documented in a very clear way that there are three, three inquisitorial cases against Francisco Andres y Juan Gomez Robledo that identify them as crypto Jewish by witnesses, no one or two, but by a dozen of witnesses. And we have, they have documented family practices related to Judaism. What family practices? Again, circumcision and death ritual. So that's for me, the basic points why I do think as a genealogist and a historian that it's fair to say or oh, it's safe for me to say that the Romero families, not any Romeros, but that Romero family coming from Corral de Almaguer and that Francisco Gomez, they have a uh, Jewish ancestry. So now some final considerations and will this, I will shut up. Citizenship, please keep this in mind. Citizenship is the most, most important right that any country can give you. When you apply for citizenship, it's not like applying to a driving, li a driving license. I know that the process on paper looks very simple, not simple. It's the highest honor, that, and the high, I'm gonna call it the highest honor because I consider my citizenship, my US citizenship as my honor. It's my badge of honor. Um, I'm proud of my citizenship. I'm proud of my country. It's the biggest right that the country can give you, okay? Acquiring citizenship is a long, long process. Keep in mind time, effort, money, and patience. I can talk you I can talk about my personal experience with American with US immigration. I was a case book. It took me several years, several years working, living, paying my taxes here to get my citizenship, okay? Look always for professional advice. Talk to lawyers, talk to genealogists, okay? We're here to help you. We are here to help you. 
If you want to work with me, with Henrietta, with whoever else, and then we will have some names. It's up to you. That's why you have to practice due diligence. In Spanish, we say, ¿Dónde va Vicente? ¿Dónde va la gente? Where is Vincent going? Wherever people go. That's not the way of choosing. When you, when you pick and choose a genealogist, ask for background, uh, not background check. I mean, I'm talking about knowledge, uh, experience. Um, mm, lawyers, the same thing. How many cases have you handled? What's your experience? Is this something that you have done before? Is this something that you haven't done before? Like, can I see an example of your work? Those are the kind of things that you need to ask. Practice, practice, practice due diligence. Also remember that the CAL and CIP, they have a team of professionals working on this. So one day you send the document. It's, uh, I love what Henrietta says. So Henrietta, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, attribute that to you. It's the taxi driver, the taxi driver um, symptom. You never, when you take, when you take, when you take a, a, ta a, a, a taxi, you never know how it's gonna be the driving of the driver. So the same thing, when you send the paperwork there, you never know who's gonna be reading it. So the more information, the more analysis, the more, the more work you put in, the more love, the more love and work and effort you put in those documents, the better. The better. Um, when I do one of those, I mean, I finished a couple. Uh, when I do something like this, it's, it's like, it's like consistent. I mean, it's like a hundred pages when you do the research. I mean, you saw just presenting this, it has, for you, it has uh, taken like an hour and 20 minutes now. So imagine when you put all this on writing. So that's my, that's my final thought. So thank you very much. Before that, I want to say a special thanks to Stanley Hortz, Henrietta Martinez, Tiffany, Linnea, and Raymond. Seriously, guys. I mean, you have been behind my back. You have been a tremendous help, a tremendous support, and I adore you. You are my friends, so, and this research would have not been possible without you and cracking the whip on my back. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, thank you to all of you. You have been great. I love you guys. And when you see this presentation, think about those people. Uh, without them, this is impossible. Okay. So now, thank you, you very much for your interest and in this presentation. Um, here you have my name and here you have my email. Um, again, I apologize because I don't know exactly who did the, the presentation for that document from the Inquisition. So it was shared with me, I asked, but I never got an answer. Okay, so now questions and answers. Okay, Jordy, how are you? Thank you, that was great. Tired, it's an hour and 20 minutes. Tired, yeah. <laughs> so Alexander has a question. What kind of death rituals were recorded? The, re the death rituals normally have to do with turning the face towards the wall and emptying, um, and emptying, uh, how do you call it? Containers with water. There is a Kabbalistic tradition that when you die, <sighs> Judaism is a little weird about, about that now when you think about um, When you die, the process is called goses, G-O-S-E-S. -E this is when you are terminal. So when you're terminal, when you're goses, when you're dying, what happens is that you have to be, you are to be comfortable. So it's forbidden to have anything that will make you uncomfortable. So they're gonna fluff your pillows, they're gonna keep it silent. Part of in this process is to turn people towards the wall in terms of not seeing, I mean, because, and I'm thinking about now that I have lost my mother-in-law, it can be very annoying for someone who is in the process of dying. Think about this. Let me put it in different terms. How many times have you heard? I was with my mother. I was with my dad in the process of dying. I went just out for a coffee or for a break. And when I came back, my father or my mother died. How many times have you heard that? Probably many times. Because dying is a very private moment. So if the person when is when the go says when the person who is dying 
A is being exposed to all this mo motion around him or her, the tradition is to turn it towards the, the wall to give uh, that sense of more privacy, okay? So that's one thing. And the other thing is to empty containers with water. There is this tradition that when the soul comes out from the, from the body, the soul can get, I'm gonna say stuck, uh, can be attached to containers with water. So there is a tradition of throwing away the, the, the water from those containers. So empty, empty containers. So that's, those are two traditions that are there. Okay, thank you. Another sure. question is, uh, regarding Carvajal and the Jorge families, where are we on the research with that? Uh, I can answer it if you want, but I'll let you answer. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> in both in both cases, I would say we don't have enough records. Um, one of the things. Oh, thank you for the question. That's very important. Why did we choose Bartolomé Romero? Let me start there. One of the requirements is that you have, as I said, you have to bring a genealogy that is fully documented. So what's gonna be um, fully documented? You have to bring proof of the documents. We had something called Pueblo Revolt and some of those documents went, were, uh, went up in flames. So that's gonna produce a break. So in New Mexico, we have been blessed with a very dry weather. So that's my joke, except for pyramids and mummies. Um, we have papyrus. Yeah, we have documents, but unfortunately from time to time, we encounter problems with those documents that we don't have complete records. So the Carvajal fall there, there is no document there is no documentary proof that links Juan Victoria Carvajal and the Carvajal family here to the Carvajals in Nuevo Leon. An educated guest, yes, we can do that. We can because how many how many Europeans were around here at the end of the 1500s? Very few. Um, I read an article back during summer that says that in Nueva Galicia, probably there were about 150 European families. Um, gee, I mean, so most probably, yes, we're talking about the same family, but how you go from the probably to the 100% sure, this is what you have to keep in mind. For the Jorges, that's a different take. I have worked with Ray. Ray has shared documents with me and Raymond, um, so if you want to jump, if you're there and you want to jump to, um, I cannot put my finger there. Yes, they move around. Yes, they have something. But again, remember, this is uncovering what has been kept secret. And they have fought very carefully to cover the traces. So sometimes there is a, PI uh, work to be done there. And the Jorge's, um, it's one of those cases that you can sense something. Again, it can be an, an educated guess. I can do that in an article, on a historical article that I can work on that thesis, but I would need always documents, written documents to prove that. That's, the, that's a difficult step to do. That's sometimes the, the difficulty that we have. Right. I think the answer is we just don't have documentation to, to take it that far back and to create the genealogical evidence that's required for the application process. But uh, also, the, but also it's, a general, it's a general historical consideration. Right. It's with all families. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Okay. Ron Cordova, do we know that uh, Francisco Gomez, is there a relation between him and the Portuguese royal family? I can answer that. We know his dad, right? Manuel Gomez. Manuel Gomez, correct. But I think and after that, we don't know anything, really. We don't know anything. So I'd say no. 
Then another, we have some DNA questions. Somebody, Paul Visaraga, oh, uh, says, I have 8% Sephardic uh, Jew on my family tree. Is that enough to pursue this? They don't do DNA. They don't take DNA as a... No, they don't take, they don't take DNA. Uh, they don't take DNA. What I would recommend is contact the genealogist. Uh, do... Uh, do a pre-research. There is nothing wrong um, doing a pre-research. I mean, Henrietta, I mean, you pick any, you you can kick in in terms of because you well, never know. I mean, never judge the book by the cover. Never judge a family by the family names. Right. So you know, you just have to do your genealogical research. And again, uh, the reason we pick or have been using or utilizing most of the Romero, Gomez, Robledo family is they have that big inquisition document in the 1600s that gives us that DNA uh, genealogical evidence that we need to create the narrative and, and bring those family ties together. If, if we didn't have that, uh, we really would have a hard time uh, getting him even back to Spain at that point. So you don't have to have Jewish DNA to do this process. So we have another uh, comment. Uh, Grandma used to throw salt over her shoulder during a thunderstorm. Do you know anything about that? My grandma did that too, but she said, so the lightning would stop, but I don't know if that's the right answer. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what you said. Uh, point number one. Um, you can you can go into family search and you can do a quick review of your family. If you're from New Mexico, I mean, I'm going to say most of the stuff is out there. Um, a quick review through bibliography. It's going to take what three or four hours for anybody to go through this. And exactly, I'm echoing what um, Henrietta was saying that we're all related. I mean, we sorry, uh, families here are all related. Um, and I want to add what I said about in my previous slide about genealogies. My invitation for you is this is also to learn. This can be also a great opportunity for you to learn about the, your own past, your own family, what's in your genes, what they went through. I mean, again, think about a girl at age 10 being married to a 40 year old man, you have to have psychological consequences down the road. Okay, next question. Let's do two more questions. One of them is, can you speak about how CIL, C -I -L, has regarded applications with Bartolome Romero? Are you optimistic that they'll accept that? And um, have we had any approved? Okay. That's that's interesting. I, I cannot talk about the past. Um, the only thing that I can talk about is the future. And we're working. Uh, Henrietta, you can, you can jump in. I mean, we're working to defend. And this is also why we're doing all this. We are working. We're putting documents together. We are defending the case. Uh, we honestly think that this is a genuine good case um, that needs to be taken into consideration. I think discussing this with other genealogists, I think that what has happened is that there was some confusion about who Francisco Gomez is. And, and now they want to see more information. So, so basically, basically, this is this is this is where this is where it's going. Uh, it's a work in progress. Um, the other problem is that when you send the document there, it's going to take them like six months to have the feedback. So it's kind of a doing echo, 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 echo. It takes six months. It takes it's it's a long time sometimes. So imagine that you did one thing in one document that now six months later, you are sending the, you get the feedback from the application. But in the meantime, you already sent other 100 documents. So <laughs> then it, it, it's, it's hard to work in those conditions. So we're always like 
months behind the work that we have done in previous months. So right, I, I would I would add to that that um, if you send when if you decide to do this process, send your application in. Let's just say that at generation eight, they come back after six months and they want more information. So there is what we call that kickback. I mean, they're not going to just approve it straight off. And in three months, mm -hmm. you'll have this citizenship. Yep. So then you have to resubmit that, that one line, let's say generation eight. And you may wait six more months for them to get back to you to make sure that that was OK. So the process has been uh, pretty long. A lot of people, because Spain closed uh, their application process, are now going to Portugal. And so part of it is we don't have enough uh, time has passed from time from applications being submitted to today to really tell you that um, you know we've had tons of experience or not. It's not anything like Spain at all. So um, you know we're just hopeful that if people do the right uh, thing, it'll happen. So uh, quick questions here in this lecture. What about Roy Ball? Well, the Roy Ball wife, uh, Ignacio Roy Ball's wife, ties back to the Romero family. We've used that line extensively. Um, yeah. uh, let's see what else you, I did a, I, Henrietta did a, a genealogy. Uh, you don't, the application process for Spain and Portugal are different. Um, at this yes. point, I would contact Rabbi Jordi. Uh, he's, he's taking clients right now. And I think I had another question that I uh, tried to answer um about oh what is it copies can you get a copy of the it says preo but i want to say presentation and the answer is we're going to put this on our youtube channel and i think that's it and so um okay my grandparents are from the azores does that have anything to? Oh yes, yes. grandparents. <laughs> if your grand, yes. if your grandparent, if your grandparents from the uh, from the uh, storage, uh, talk to a Portuguese lawyer. Talk to if Teresa is there. Teresa can give you more information. This is not the first case that I have encountered. I there was a Soros is a group of Portuguese islands it literally in the middle of the Atlantic and they normally came to fish in front of the American coast in front of Boston so that's why you have lots of uh, Portuguese presence in Boston Massachusetts all, all that uh, New England so also um, here so so yeah, oh. double check with a Portuguese lawyer. The process of obtaining citizenship through your grandparents is different from this one. Right. Okay, so Vincent says, I have a genealogical report back to these families. Should I work with my genealogist to tie into the story of the presentation, blah, blah, blah. The answer would be yes, if you're gonna apply for citizenship. If you're not gonna apply for citizenship, <laughs> I wouldn't, I, you know, we charge for this. So I wouldn't pay somebody to do that unless you really want to pay for it, I guess. Uh, but there's a lot of other ways you can verify uh, the genealogy or have somebody take a look at it. And um, there was a question about the, we talked about this, Jordi, about the rabbi that was arrested in Portugal today. If there's going to be any uh, <laughs> issues with this uh don't family. bring shame we don't, to your we community. don't know that's rule number one we just don't know uh, we don't know so. at this point at this point that came out yesterday night a friend shared the news with me and i was already in bed uh it was like oh yes goody why not i mean and tomorrow I have a presentation of this um so that's why i was expecting that this would pop up i have no idea um this is very unfortunate for number one, uh, as a member of the Jewish community, uh, as a rabbi, I'm very much appalled for that behavior, if that's true. Um, I don't know what's gonna be the consequences. Oh, so you have there, Teresa, 
So I don't know if you want to kick in regarding regarding this. If right, you think Ter this Teresa be... Santos, who works with the law firm in Portugal, put her yeah. email up there. It's Teresa Santos at Martin Martins Martins Castro. Castro .pt. I will write that down. This is being right. recorded. We will put it on our YouTube channel. Jordi, muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you all thank for you very much. today. Thank you, very, thank you very much to everybody for being here today. And as I said, thank you to you, um, Henrietta. Thank you to Jordan, the magic guy behind, behind yes. the scenes. Um, I love you guys. Thank you to everybody who has been here. Um, I'm a genealogist. I'm a historian. Although I'm not New Mexican, I'm very passionate about New Mexico, as you can see. Um, this is my this is my life. This is my family. Um, I'm very passionate about this. Um, this is something that I bring very inside of me. So it has been a pleasure for me to share you not my knowledge on this and your knowledge also on this entry. So already, so you, again, you are the mother also for this project. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Anyway, we've had fun. Uh, you know, it's always fun to do genealogy. It's fun to pull those uh, dead bones out of our trees yeah. and take a closer look at them. I think the history that goes along with this uh, Romero Robledo family is fascinating. And we have researchers in Spain that are helping us uncover more material yes. and some in Portugal. Again, I want to thank everybody that attended today. Uh, yep. We will put out some information for our next speaker, which will probably be in June. And just have a great uh, weekend. And don't forget to change your clocks tonight. Anyway, muchas gracias. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you all for attending. Thank you. Yeah, Jordan, we're done. Bye-bye. Bye. Yep, thanks. Bye.